Behind me I've got some red wines that are going through malolactic fermentation. And today we're going to talk about how to make a malolactic bacteria starter, along with some tips to try to improve your chances of success at completing malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation is a bacterial fermentation where harsh malic acid is converted to smoother lactic acid. Now this happens on almost all red wines and occasionally you'll also see this happen on white wines. Normally you'll put a wine through malolactic fermentation after primary fermentation or alcoholic fermentation is complete, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you want to learn a lot more specifics about malolactic fermentation, I've got a video. I believe it's called What is Malolactic Fermentation, where I go really, really far into the details about the process. During malolactic fermentation, there's a byproduct that's created called diacetyl. So diacetyl is that kind of buttery characteristic that you smell in a wine. And again, it's a byproduct of this bacterial fermentation. During malolactic fermentation, one way to kind of monitor how things are going is to watch the change in pH. As that bacteria is converting the malic acid to lactic acid, you'll see a subtle increase in pH. So the wine's becoming slightly less acidic. And it's very, very slow. It can take five or six weeks for this to complete. And over that five or six weeks, you might only see a change of about 0.2 in pH. So you really need a good pH meter to monitor this. You should also see an occasional bubble coming out of your airlock during an active malolactic fermentation since malolactic bacteria creates CO2. And these can be really spaced out. You might only see a bubble every 10 minutes. It's really much slower uh, than an alcoholic fermentation with yeast. And if you really want to know for sure if it's complete, you're going to have to do paper chromatography, which Normally I don't recommend on little batches like this because it's kind of an expensive test for a really small batch of wine. And if you're doing everything I'm going to mention in this video, you'll find that your malolactic fermentations really, really reliably finish. So how do you get a malolactic fermentation started? Well, in the simplest sense, it could just start its own self. Malolactic bacteria is in the wild, so it's often coming in on the grapes, it's often in the barrels. So there's a chance it could start on its own, but to make things a little bit more reliable, we'll often choose a malolactic bacteria culture and add that ourselves. And that, that has some advantages as well because a byproduct of malolactic fermentation it are some histamine type uh, chemicals, basically. So if you use some of these cultured malolactic bacteria, they're generally selected to have really, really low histamine production. So if you're sensitive to wine, you might want to intentionally choose these pretty reliable, good malolactic cultures that you get in a packet like, um, I like CH16, I like CH35. They're probably my top two strains. So if you're not gonna do it natural and you are gonna choose a strain like these freeze-dried strains, the next easiest but not most reliable thing would be just to sprinkle it on top of the wine. So I take the airlock off, sprinkle it on, and then just hope everything goes well. And in most wines that actually still is gonna work okay. The challenging situations will be wines that have a low pH. So if your pH is below like 3.5, or wines that have a high alcohol. So if your, your wine has something like 14% alcohol, those are relatively challenging situations for malolactic fermentation to get going. And that's when I'll take the next step and actually make a malolactic starter. If you're gonna make a malolactic starter, you may choose to use a rehydration nutrient. So just like you can use GoFirm with a yeast starter, you can use something called Acti ML for a malolactic starter. And this just helps kind of provide the needed nutrients for that malolactic bacteria, which are much different than the needed nutrients for yeast. So you can't really interchange those products. If you're gonna use Acti ML, you're gonna use 20 grams 
per gram of malolactic bacteria that you're gonna use. And these little freeze-dried packets, they have about four grams of malolactic bacteria, which is good for about 66 gallons of wine. So if you wanna split that packet up, um, it's kind of a good reference point of how much is in there in the first place. Now the water that you're gonna to wanna to use to hydrate this is really gonna ideally be distilled water. If I'm making a yeast starter, yeast is just so much easier to get started. I'll often use tap water, but if I'm making a malolactic starter, I'm always gonna use distilled water to make that just as optimal of environment as possible. And you're gonna to wanna to use about 100 milliliters of water per gram of malolactic bacteria. Next, you're gonna to wanna to provide the optimal temperature to get that bacteria to kind of get going. And that's gonna be somewhere in the um, like 76 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So you want that kind of lukewarm temperature to provide a nice environment to help that bacteria get going and start to multiply on its own. So once you've got your ACTML nicely dissolved in your 77 degree water, you can go ahead and add your bacteria to it and give it kind of just a little swirl to kind of stir it up. After about 15 minutes, you can decide to just go ahead and add that directly to your wine. So in that case, you would divvy it up. Um, I like to use something like a graduated cylinder to nice and evenly divvy that up between the wines. But personally, I'm actually gonna take it one step further to make sure this starter is even more robust. So the next step that I'm going to take is to use some unsulfited juice. This provides a source of malic acid for that bacteria and it provides really not nothing to inhibit it versus if you were to add something with alcohol or something with sulfite. So that kind of gives a little bit more food for that bacteria. One good juice to use is actually apple juice because it's got a lot of malic acid. And then I'll let this sit for another 15 minutes. At this point, you should start to smell some buttery notes coming out of that starter. It should smell kind of like movie popcorn or maybe like butterscotch. And then the next thing I will do is I'll take some of the wine that I'm going to add my starter to and I'll add that to my starter. And that just kind of helps everything kind of acclimate. If you didn't have any unsulfited juice, you still would want to usually do this step by adding a little bit of wine to your starter. And now we can go ahead and add our starter to the wines. So I found that to generally help malolactic fermentation get off the ground, but really there is a lot more to it than just making a good starter. You really want to provide good conditions for malolactic fermentation. The first thing to do is just keep that wine relatively warm or about room temperature. You want it to be about 70 to about 73 degrees Fahrenheit if you want it to really reliably go. Um, I'll let it get down to about 68 and generally that's still going to be okay, but it's going to be a much slower fermentation. After you know a week or two weeks, I'll give the lees just a really gentle stir. A lot of the things, the nutrients that help this bacteria keep going are settled out in those lees. If you give it just a little gentle stir, you should see some little bubbles coming up when you're doing this if everything is going well. And I'll probably do it again in, you know, at about three weeks if I'm really concerned that it's gonna be a challenging wine. And then finally, another thing that I like to do to encourage that bacteria just to keep on going is to add oak in conjunction with adding that bacteria. It just kind of gives all these little pores and things for that bacteria to kind of get stuck in rather than settling out to the bottom of that wine. And in some ways it kind of replicates what would happen in a barrel, which is a really reliable environment for malolactic bacteria to do its thing. One of the tough things about malolactic fermentation is you really want to do it when the wine has very, very little sulfites. So the wine is somewhat un protected. If you've added sulfites at the crush and to kind of hold back bacteria that came in on the wild, well those are pretty much gone by now. So I, I mean I'm kind of relying on the CO2 
created by this malolactic fermentation to create a really, really anaerobic environment that makes sure that really most other things aren't gonna try to live in that wine. But once we're pretty confident that malolactic fermentation is complete, we are gonna wanna give this wine a good um, dose of sulfite or sulfur dioxide or SO2. And that's just gonna help protect it all the way through the aging period. If you're the kind of person that wants to drink your wine in like four months, which I generally wouldn't recommend with these red wines made from grapes, well, maybe you can get away with no sulfites. But the game we're playing here are wines that will age for, you know, a year and a half, two years, even up to five years. So we really need to use those sulfites. And that pretty much covers the quick tips to have a successful malolactic fermentation. If you like content like this, make sure to check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash makewine, where I'll often upload short little videos like this. Um, I've got lots of little writings on there, tips you can learn more about myself, and sometimes we'll even put um, artwork. I do a little bit of photography on the side, so I'll do some free downloads of things that you might want to put in your wine cellar, so wine-related photography. If you have any tips or tricks to make sure that your malolactic fermentation goes extra smooth, make sure to mention in the comments below as well. Thanks for watching.